Okay, so hello everyone. Good morning, how are you? I'm still kind of sleepy, but I'll try to keep it energized. Um, my name is Martin Gontaunicas, as he's saying, but since we are in the tech world, nobody knows my, my, my name. So my Twitter handle is mgonto. If you wanna follow me and increase my ego, I would be greatly appreciated. And then the name of the talk that I put in here when I submitted was Rethinking, web tasks, uh, Rethinking Backends with Web Task. But then I switched it to this one because I started watching Orange is the New Black and this one sounds like a more catchy name. So now it's the front is the new back. That seems like a cool name maybe. So I am a software developer from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I work at OutZero, which is a SaaS for authentication and authorization. And basically I used to be working there coding JavaScript all day long. So this was me, I was like hampering on the keyboard maybe, something like that. But now, I work as a developer advocate. I don't work with Al Pacino, I love Al Pacino though. And a lot of people ask me, what does that mean? And basically, I've been doing that since I was 17 years old. And here I'm in a karaoke singing on stage. Now, instead of singing, which I, I'm very, very bad at that, I'm speaking about technology around like different places. And for that, I still need to code because if you don't code, it's like you're doing nothing. What are you, what are you speaking about? So. Let me actually tell you about a day in my life. It's actually pretty similar to today because I couldn't wake up either. I never, I can never wake up. I wake up at 11 a.m. but I still can't wake up. I recently bought an espresso machine so I take like, I don't know, 100 coffees. And after that, I actually had an idea. We were going to the OSCON conference and in there we wanted basically to engage with people. So what we thought is, why don't we create a quiz where people answer questions about security authentication, and then if they answer it correctly, we basically give them bitcoins. So I was like, that sounds like a good idea. This would be basically the UI. So that's easy. Let's just code it. Let's just do it. So again, programming time. And I finished the front end part pretty easy. It wasn't that hard, but then I realized that I needed more stuff. So for example, I needed to send emails to people. One day I finished a quiz, I needed to send them an email telling them like, hey, you finished the quiz, now we can send you bitcoins, we can send you money. And that means that I needed to connect to Coinbase API so that we could transfer money from the Outzero account to that, that person account. And also we wanted to make sure that the bitcoins were only redeemed once because otherwise they would screw us basically. And for that, we needed to connect to a MongoDB in this case, it could be any DB. But the idea is that we need to connect to a database to say this Bitcoin has been redeemed or this Bitcoin has not been redeemed. So for that, you actually need to write a backend API. So I was like, okay, I'm a front-end developer, I know JavaScript, let's just build a JS server. But wait, because in order to build a JS server, it's not that easy to setting up manually. So I said, okay, I've read about Express, let's try Express, but wait, because in order to write Express, you need to install Node.js. So I was like, okay, let's actually install Node.js, but wait, because if I need to install Node.js, which should I install? Now there's IOJS, Node.js, point 0.10, point 0.12, um, 1.0, 1.1, 1 .1, so, I didn't have a clue which one I had to install. So I was like this. It's like I need to do so, so, so many things to write a simple backend that just needs to send email, connect to Coinbase API, and connect to a Mongo. And that's it. That's all I needed. But let's say that, okay, I do that, and now the app is completely finished. So basically, I'm happy. It's like, yay, I've done it. But wait. Because that's not it. I need to do more stuff. Like, where should I deploy this? Should I deploy this to Heroku? Should I deploy this to Amazon? How can I deploy it there? And once I, I know where, how do I do it? I mean, I've never sent anything to Amazon EC2. Do I need to install a machine? Do I need to install Nginx? How do I install Nginx? How do I install Apache? And there were a lot of things that I needed to do. Also, like, how can I make it scale? Let's imagine that I get I'm lucky and I get like two million users visiting me. Okay, that's good. So how can I make it scale? How can I make it work for all that people? And then how can I make it secure so that nobody can hack me? So all of those 
are actually a lot of questions that when you need to code backend, you basically need to answer them. Those are a lot of things that you actually need to know for that. So the thing is that I needed to do so, so, so many things to write this simple backend. And what I would want is for backend development to be more like frontend development in the way that I can just, for example, write something, press F5, refresh it, and boom, I can see the changes. I can't do that with the backend. And also for the backend, I need to install like or a very big system like Node.js, Express, and this, and this, and that, to just try it out. To do front-end development, all I need to do is install Chrome, or Firefox, or whatever, and that's it. I can start coding it. So the question is, what if I could just send this email from the front-end? Or what if I could actually connect to the MongoDB directly from the front-end without needing a back-end server? Or what if I could call the Coinbase API which actually doesn't support uh, calling it from the front end because, of course, directly from the front end. At that point, I would actually be happy. So what we started thinking where I work is about something like this, where you have in the bottom it says scripting Node.js in the browser, and it says like Node.js point 12 meets the browser, okay? And basically, if you see the HTML, it has like two parts. The first one, it's a script that it's saying that type is Node.js, and in there, it just returns a regular function. But if you check the code, it calls this callback with Node.js process.version meets context.data. Process.version doesn't exist in the front end, but process.version does exist in a Node.js server. Still, I'm actually writing this in this index.html. That's the basic idea of it. And then what I have is my regular script where basically I'm creating this web task if it doesn't matter what it is, I'm creating this hello, which is basically a proxy to this. And then I'm calling this hello with some data, which is the browser, which gets displayed in the end. And then once I get the result, I just show it in the HTML. So this is basically what we wanted to accomplish. And we wanted to accomplish this because for us, we've been doing a lot of like product pages, front-end paging, marketing pages, and for all of those, we needed backend. And backend for us was the bottleneck. And if front-end people could do, I mean, they can code a front-end app, why not just code something as simple as this, or as sending an email, or connecting to Mongo, or something like that? I mean, I can definitely write that if I don't need to configure a server, deploy it, and, all of, and do all of that. That was the basic premise of what we wanted to accomplish. So we had this in mind. This was the end of what we actually wanted to do. So once we knew where we were heading, once we knew what, what we wanted, we were like, OK, how can we actually do that? So for that, we basically need to go back to the basics and understand how the connection between your front end app and your back end app works. So it's as simple as this. We have always a client and a server. The client is the browser, which is Chrome or something like that. And then it basically calls the server. So if we go deeper, it looks like this. We have the client, which is Chrome, and it has like some client code. It could be JavaScript, for example. And then in there, the user will input some data. That data will get sent to the server through an API. And then the server will process it and return back <coughs> new data and that will get displayed in the client. So, okay, and then what is the server? The server basically has first the CPU, RAM, hard disk, which will let me run my server. It also has an operative system again, which will let me run my server. And then what I have is server code, which is the code that basically will do the API calls that it will do the actions that I need. And it also has some secrets. Those secrets could be, for example, connection string to Mongo, API key and API password to some email provider or something like that. And those secrets are actually used by the server code. So we started looking at this and we started thinking like, hey, how can we do this? How can we implement this but do it in the front end? And as thinking is so hard, I put a t-shirt time. I always wanted to throw a t-shirt out of stage, so I'm doing it. <laughs> and now we're continuing thinking. So we keep on thinking about how can we implement this. And for that, it's like, oh, okay. I know what we can do now. And let's actually focus on the server. 
As I was saying before, we have the hardware and the operative system, which actually lets me run tasks. And then the tasks itself are the server code that ends up using some secrets like connection strings and stuff like that. So what if we could separate that and we could get basically the server code and the secrets and put those in the front end. And then in this case, our server is just basically a runner where what we will do is we will get the server code and the secrets in the front end and every time we need to run something, we'll send that back to the server and, this, and we'll tell the server run this and then create an output and give me back my output. So the idea is that the server code and the secrets will live in the client and my server is just a runner. It will just run code. That's the basic premise of what we wanted. So with that, a few questions start to arise. Like for example, the first one is, okay, we all know that the front end code is seen by everyone. It's JavaScript. And if you click view source in your browser in Chrome, you can see everything. So if we put the secrets, they are like connection strings and API keys, everybody could see it. Also, how can we optimize and cache this server code? Because that's the basic premise of a backend. The nice thing about the backend is that it can actually cache it and then make it faster to run it. And also, if we're sending this server code and it's big and on every request and we are telling it like, run this for me, that will make all the requests take much longer, much more time because the latency will be bigger because the requests body will be much, much bigger. So these were the first questions that we had when thinking about it. And we'll come back to this a little bit later today in the talk, but let's actually first see it in motion. So what you can see here is that I'm doing a curl to some endpoint that's called run. I'm sending, I'm telling it, I'm gonna send you like some text basically. And the text that I'm sending, it's a function that receives a callback. And then we call that callback with null saying that there's absolutely no error. And then some string, hello world, which will be what we will display. So let's actually copy and paste it. And let's go here and let's actually call it. So if I run this, you can see that what I got is just the hello world, which is exactly what I just sent. So let's modify it a little bit and let's see what else we can do with this. So let's get, for example, something that we can show is the process.version as we were showing in the previous example. So instead of hello world, let's say hello world plus process.version. So let's copy, paste. And in this case, I'm running Node.js point 10, 13. So it's saying hello world point 10, 13. And then another thing that, for example, we can do is just send parameters to this, for example, as a request param. So let's say that run and we'll say that who is uh, me, mgonto. So now it's hello process.version plus a space plus uh, we need to now be able to get this data that we receive as a parameter. So for that, in the function that we return here, we can actually get a context besides this callback. And we can get from the context this variable, which is called who. So now if we run it again, it's saying hello world, process.version, and whatever I got as a parameter. But the basic premise of this is that I'm calling an endpoint that's called, that's, that's called run, that's it. And then I'm sending the code that it needs to execute. It will execute there, and then it will return to me the responses of, of actually executing that code in the server. That's the basic premise of this, and it's, that's actually pretty simple to understand. So what is the server in this case? And let's actually open it. This is a minimal version of the server that we need for this. This is the code. It's actually pretty small. And the basic idea is that I'm receiving here the code, I'm parsing it as a function, and then once I parse it as a function, I will basically run it and sending the parameters that I receive. That's all that I'm doing here. And this example is very small. Of course, it, it, it has like problems, like for example, it's not being sandboxed. It's basically doing an eval. So if we wanted the user not to be able to access like the file system or the, of the runner or to not access like a lot of other stuff like that for the runner, we would need to set up some things like Docker or stuff like that. But once we set up this runner for the first time or if there's like a, something that we can have for the runner, then for us, that works. The only problem is that we, if we host it ourselves, this is what I'm hosting right now locally, 
if I wanted to like delete all my file system, I could, which of course is not ideal. But the basic premise is just this. It's just this code. So now the demo time is what I just did, so no demo time now. And now, if we want to do this same thing, this curl that I just did from a single page up, well, we can actually just do it. It's, it's not that hard either. So let me actually show you. It's this one. This is what we want to do. It's the same example. It's saying hello web task. It says say hello to, you write some word, and when you click say hello, it will say hello and that name. It's exactly the same example that we did with the curl, but we're going to do it in a single page app. So if we go to the code and we come, let's close this, we come here. What you will see is that first we have this say hello. It's just the, the hello for the person. It has the button. And in here, it just has an ID. And then we have this say hello button. So in here, what you can see is that we added this script type text JavaScript. We're doing the typical document ready. And then what we're doing is first, we are handling the button click. And in there, all that we're doing is just doing an Ajax call to this run endpoint, the same one as we were doing in the other example. And then we're sending this who as a parameter, and it's saying the value of the text field. And then in the data, we're sending the function that we want it to run. Basically, it's this context.who. Let me actually do something before. Sorry. Done. So because there was something that I modified before, and it wouldn't run, I think. So this is the example that it shows. So now if I come here and I say Gonto, click say hello, it's saying hello, Gonto, and it's showing the process.version that we actually had before. That's basically all that, that, that it's doing right now. So when I click on there, it's basically sending that code back to the server. The server will run this code, and then it will return me the output in here. That's all that it's doing. So in this case, I'm writing this backend code basically locally. And that's all that, I, that, that I'm doing. I'm running this backend code, not locally in the server runner, sorry, but I'm writing the code that it needs to run, in this case, in, in here, and sending it back to the server so that it can run it. And that's it. That's actually all that I'm doing. So let's actually go back to the presentation. And this works OK. This was like a very simple example. But something that we actually need to do is sometimes we need to send some secrets. So in this example, the next example that we're doing is we're actually going to send an email. That's the basic idea. And sending that email will require an API key and an API password for that email. And that's what we're, we want to use to send to the user. So that's how do we do that? How do we keep this? API key, how do we keep these secrets in the front end, but without letting people to see it? And again, for this, we have to think. And again, I'll throw another t-shirt. <laughs> Sorry, I almost killed somebody. And now, if we continue to think about it, what we can do is we can focus again on what we had before. So we had the server code and the secrets, and those were actually set in the front end. So how can we actually secure that? We just put a lock and that's it. No, what, what we actually need to do if we want to secure that is we need to be able to set these secrets in the front end code. We need to be able to send these secrets to the basic application in the client. But we need to send them so that it can't see the values. And for that, what we can actually do is we can actually set those secrets encrypted in the client somehow. So basically what we'll do is we will create first, before putting that code in the client, before putting that code in the front end, we will create these secrets, encrypt them, and then just put a token that has that information encrypted into the client. And then the client will send that information. It won't know exactly what it is, but then the server will actually be able to run it. So let me actually show you what it would look like. In this case, this is the token that I have. And this token itself will it ins inside have the secrets. And that's what I will send back and forth from the front end back to the back end. So let's see how we could do this. Let's actually first open the web. It's 
uh, examples, SPA send email. And now the example is, oh, again, like very beautiful UI. I'm, I'm, I'm like very, very bad with CSS. So this is all I know from design is bootstrap. That's all my abilities. But in this case, what we will do is we will just send an email. So let's actually see the code. So the first thing that we will see is that the index itself that we're going to send the email is very similar to the previous one. It sends the email, it has a, an input type field, and it has a button. And then let me actually show you something. So in this case, what we're going to try to do is instead of having the backend code itself in here written, what we're going to do is we're going to write a separate file for that. So in this case, we have this send email.js. And something that you can see in here is first, we can do requires, like we do in front end or like we do in back end. In this case, we are requiring requests. And basically, what we're doing is we have this request.post. We're calling the sendgrid API. And we're sending here some sendgrid user, sendgrid key, and the context.2 with the information to to whom we need to basically send that. So this is a basic JavaScript. So in this case, we'll do the bare bones, but what, what, what we're, we need to do is just fetch this JavaScript file from my frontend and then be able to send it back to the server. So for that, the first thing that you will see is this. Basically what it's doing is it's doing an Ajax call with a get, content, content type text plane, and it's going to this URL, this send email JS, which I just shown you. And then once it got it, it just sets it in a variable that's called server code. So it's basically getting the text. Of course, we could eventually generalize this and then be able to automatically get these JavaScript files, which are actually sent to the front end. Because if we come here, I copy this and I go to send email.js, this is the code that will get run in the server. However, I'm able to access this code from here because this code is actually sent to the front end. And even though it's sent to the front end, I don't care. I mean, in this case, they can read my code. All that it's doing is it's getting some keys that I can't read, so, but it's just calling a SendGrid API. And that's all it's doing. And I can't see the information that is important for not to be seen in this case. So now the question is, how do I send this? How do I send the SendGrid user? And how do I send this, this SendGrid key? And for that, what we'll need to do is we need to do this curl. And this is calling another endpoint that instead of run, it's called create token. This create token will let me create a token which has this new encrypted information. So let's actually set some here like sendgrid user, like my user, sendgrid key, my key. And let's actually call it. I need to change server now. And now it responded me back with some token. So let's actually inspect it. This token is actually a JSON web token, but that's not exactly important for example. The only important thing about the JSON web token is that it's different to a regular token. Sorry. Because a JSON web token, it's like you, you see what you see on the left, it seems like a regular token, but this token actually has some content inside. And the content that this token has is what you see here in the right, which is saying which is the token. And then in this case, what this has is this ECTX. This ECTX is what I sent here, encrypted context. But instead of actually seeing the SendGrid user and the SendGrid key, what you're actually seeing is this rubbish, which is basically that information, but encrypted. So what is a JSON web token? How can I be sure that this is like the client is sending exactly what I'm sending? And it's basically a base64 URL encoded of the header, this, plus a base64 URL encoded of the payload of this. And then it's running a hashing algorithm over all of this and creating the last part, which is the signature with some particular secret that the server knows. We'll see how it works and why that's important in a minute. But the most important part of this is that this token will have the secrets information and the secrets that it will contain will be encrypted. So even though this will be in the front end, the front end people won't be able to read what's in there. So I actually already created a token before with my real SendGrid user and SendGrid password. So if we come back here and let's actually copy it. Now we can just do something similar to what we did before. 
we are again calling this run endpoint, sending the to with who we need to send the, the, the email to. And the main difference that you see is this. Basically now we are sending a header which is saying authorization, better, and the token. And the token that we're sending in here is the one that got created by the server at some point, which is what you see up here. And then in the data, we're sending the server code. If you remember, this server code is exactly what we got from this send email JS, and that send email JS is just the code that we need to run, which is send an email with this user and send an, an email with this key, basically. So now, if we actually run it, let me open like 10 minute mail. Let's now copy the email address, and if we come back here, refresh, we put this, and let's actually debug what it's doing. I click on say hello, error sending email, off them. It's like it was working on my computer before. Let's see what it's doing. Charity expired. Ah, awesome. Okay, let me actually create one quick. So this JSON web token is expired. Let's fake it. So let's come here. I need to find out what the secret is. We, somebody maybe can tell a joke in the meantime. This is the one. So let's change the expiration. Or let's just remove it. This is a new token. Let's see if it works now. Live coding never works, but maybe hopefully this time works. Now we come here again. I know what it was working yesterday because the token has 10 hours of to live. And now let's actually try it one more time. Uh, it's the email from here. Say hello, email was sent. So now it basically sent the email. And let's actually see the request. Let's see what happened. Basically, what it did is it called this run endpoint. And when it called this run endpoint, it's basically sending the header. In the header, it's sending this JSON web token. And that's all it's basically doing. And then if we check the request payload, it's basically sending all of the information from the email. And then my server was able to get this SendGrid API and SendGrid key. So what I'm sending here is run me this code, run that code with these secrets that I've just sent, and just send the email. That's the basic idea of what I just did. So in this case, I'm telling it, run it with this and run this code. And that's all that this example is doing. And it's pretty much as simple as the previous one. However, it seems complicated because you need to do a lot of stuff in this case to understand the concept. We'll see in a minute that we've actually created a CLI to actually automate and do this, some of this stuff automatically. But I think that in order to understand the concept, in order to understand what we're doing, it's key to actually do it by hand, at least the first time, to know what's going on. Because all that it's doing is, I mean, I don't think that it's like a, something that is really innovative. It's just a runner that runs code for me. And then that enables front-end developers to actually code that. So this is how we could, for example, send an email. However, something that we're still doing in this case is we're still sending the code that needs to get run on every call. You, I just showed you that in this request, I send the data and all the code. And as I was asking before, that means that the request will take longer because the request is much, much, much bigger. That takes a lot of time. And also it can't optimize and cache that code. So those are, those are some of the problems. The other problem is that if my runner is open and you can send the code, anybody can send code to my runner. And I don't want anyone to be able to send code to my runner because I need to pay for that. And the other thing is that this is not performant for production because the requests are really, really, really big. So how do we do it? We need to think. There's t-shirt time again, but I, one of the t-shirts broke, so I don't have a, another t-shirt, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can take mine and just throw it away. <laughs> so let's continue thinking how we can actually do that. And again, we had this server code and we had these secrets. That's what we had. So what if instead of actually sending the server code, every time to the runner, we just send a URL. 
And that URL will point to the file that needs to be executed. And if we do that, then that's it. It should basically be able to run my code. It should be able to run my code. But in, th in this case, I'm only sending the URL to run and not really the code itself. And I'm sure with this, since that's, since that's going to be part of the token, that nobody can modify that. So let's actually see it in action. It's SPA minimal code URL. I shouldn't put names so long for examples. Minimal code URL. And it's the same example as in the first time. It's basically this, hello, you need to say the word and then you write it. So let's actually see the difference with the other one. So if we come here to the index HTML, what you can see is that first, now it has, it's, now it's not sending data. We used to be sending here always a data field and that data field used to send the code itself. In this case, it's not sending anything. It's just sending a token. So why? Because in this case, we are now creating a token, but the token that we are creating, instead of actually sending some encrypted variables like a secret, a key or whatever, we're sending which URL it needs to run. So let's actually do that. Let's create this. Let's copy and paste. Let's come here, paste. We now get this new token. So let's copy. And if we go to this debugger again and we paste it, now we see that what we this has is now a code URL that is pointing to what I said before, the local cost, 3,000 examples, minimal, hello.js. And that hello.js is again seen by my front end because it's just a JavaScript file. And all that it's doing is what we did before, the hello plus context.who. That's it. That's all that it is doing. It's nothing else. So what we do now is I will, this time I will copy the new token because probably the old one is expired. So now that I have actually this token in here, all that it's doing is it's sending this token again in the authorization header, but it's not sending the code to run. And that's because the code to run is in the token itself. However, people can see that you are in the token. So let's see how this actually works. Let's actually save it. Hopefully this one works just the first time. Hello to FEC15. It's saying hello FEC15. So now if we check what got sent, there is no request payload. There used to be, but there's not anymore. It's just sending the code to run. So it's getting the code to run basically, and then it's just running the code. But some question that you could ask is, but wait, if I come here and I modify this and create like a new token, let's actually create a new token here. Let's put, I don't know, malicio HTTP, of course malicious user and then I just copy the new token and use it so now the runner would again run this URL let's actually try it out so now again FEC 15 let's delete everything say hello and now it's failing why is it failing because now I just created this token manually with a different secret that the server has since the token was created with a different secret that the server has, the server will say, no, I won't run this code because this token wasn't created by me, the server. It was created by somebody else. So this token is not valid. So I can't run this code and I can't run the code from that URL. So that prevents people from being able to, co to run code in my runner with anything else. If we check the response from here, what it's saying is exactly that. It's invalid signature. Because it's saying, no, you can't run this. You can't run this code. And at this point, I'm actually happy. Because what this means is that now I can actually start running backend code from my front end. So the basic premise of this is that I just want to code front end. That's all I want to do. I don't want to do backend anymore. I just want to code front end and be able to write these really small fr front end functions that then my backend server can run. So all of this 
it's very hard to grasp and to understand in the beginning all of this token going back and forward and how it works. But if you can create a wrapper that works on it for the first time, then that's it. For you, it's just run me this code that is in the front end and you send the JavaScript and that's it. That's all it needs. And that's basically what we are using at OutZero. As I said, we're making a lot of landing pages, marketing pages and stuff like that. And now our front end developers are able to send emails, are able to connect to a MongoDB and do all of that without the need of a backend server. So we are the first users of this. And what we did is we, the, the, the part of the server code and the secrets that is run on the front end side, we just call it web tasks. That's the name that we put it. So we created this webtask.io, which is basically a web task playground. It's, it's, it's a runner that will run code and lives on the cloud. It's just to try it out, basically, if you like the idea, and that's it. So the idea is that you can actually go to the website, you can log in with GitHub, Twitter, or Facebook, and then you can just try it out. I will actually show you an example of this same thing that we did, but using WebTask. So first, what you need to do is you need to install something that is called WT Clean. It's a WebTask CLI, and it will let you create these web tasks uh, fast. I won't install it because if the internet doesn't work, my CLI will break. And once you have that, then you can basically write some JavaScript like we did before. So let's come here. Let, let's do a hello.js. Ah, I already created it. So this hello.js, it returns a function. It's the same that we did before. It has this context callback and it says return cv hello my dearest and context.data.who which is the parameter that I'm going to receive. So now I want to create a web task basically with this front end code. So we can do something like wt dash dash uh, name, I don't know, hello world. And then let's actually watch it. And it's gonna call hello.js. Please enter the volume. Oh, I missed the create word. Create. And now it basically created for me this URL, which if I can try, and it's again, the same as what I was doing before. So let's come here and let's call this with, for example, who equals FEC 15. And if internet works, it says, hello, my dearest FEC 15. It's the same thing that we did before, but this runner now lives on the cloud. It has the Docker, CoreOS, blah, 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 blah. It's all free, completely free, because we're using it ourselves. So we said, like, why not just let people run it themselves as well? And basically, the idea is that it creates what, all of that I just showed you, but automatically for you. You don't have to do this token thing. It just automatically creates that for you. And then the other thing that you can do is I actually put this dash dash watch. So now if I come here and I say, hello, hello, friends, and I refresh, it now says hello friends. So whenever I save this file, that will automatically be saved again to this server and it will let me run this code. And then the last example that I wanna show you is, let's say that I have a secret. So hello friends plus my secret is plus context.data.secret. So now let's kill this and let's create it again, but now let's create it with a secret which will be, I forgot the name, secret, ah, very creative. Secret equals, uh, I don't know, my, Mike. So now it has again run it, and now if I refresh it, it says my secret is Mike. So what it did is I now I'm setting this secret and all of how this is working is exactly what I showed you. It's basically having a JSON web token, but it's storing it in, the, in, in this case in there instead of here. But the basic premise is the same. It's that you can create from some JavaScript files some run, some, something that will get run in a runner, and then I can have this code in my front end. In this case, I'm just sending this hello.js as a parameter, but if instead of that, I could set it a, a code URL like we did in the last example. And if I set the code URL there in the end, then that's it. It will run the code from that code URL and that code is in the front end. 
So with this, your front-end developer can basically write simple JavaScript functions that do one thing. This is not intended for a full backend for everything, but the reality is that, at least for us, most marketing pages that we do, they send emails, they connect to Mongo, they save something, they get something, they don't do much else. That's all they do usually. And for that, you definitely don't need a backend. So, in, if you, so everything that I just showed you here, um, it was running on my computer, just in case internet didn't work. So if you wanna get like this runner, which is open source, uh, or if you wanna get the slides, if you wanna get this example that I just did, if you go to this URL, you will have the slides, the open source runner that I just shown. Secondly, the open source runner that I showed at first, and also, and also a link to a blog post explaining all of this, basically. I just tweeted, well, my automatic self with Buffer just tweeted the slides uh, during the talk at some point. So it, it's also on my Twitter if you wanna check it out. But basically, that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. I know my head's hurting after that, uh, but um, but I'm not a developer, so uh, uh, even 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 I could pick up some useful things that I'm going to kind of take to people I, I work on dev with. Um, any we have time for one, well one question or maybe two if they're if they're not complicated answers, <laughs> which we might not get. Um, who's first up? Yep. Yes, sir. How do you question do is, how do you do the sandboxing? So what we did for the sandboxing is just setting it inside some Docker. So if your runner is inside Docker, then in Docker you can say, don't access the file system, don't access this, don't access that. That's one thing. And then the other thing that you need to do is, before running this eval, you need to tell it like, if it takes more than five or 10 seconds, kill it. So that way, if somebody does a while through, it won't stop your runner, basically. So if you do that, just set it up on, on Docker without access to file system and set up like a timeout that will not red, let run code infinitely, that's it. That leaves us with time for another question. That was good, that was very straightforward. It was either too simple or too we've complex. got one more in. No, 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 I, the, 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 it leaves a lot of people with things to think about, yes. So, How do you tackle debugging? So what basically what you would do is, like I showed you two different th ways that you can use this. You either send the code in the payload every time you call the runner or you set the code URL. Basically what we do is we always send the code in the body on development. So that way, if you modify the backend code like locally in the front end and every time that you call it, it gets sent, that means that basically you're debugging it. And then what we do is we do console logs, and then if you do console log, you will be able to see the output. And then once it's ready, once it's ready for production, then instead of sending the payload itself when calling the server, you just set a code URL, and that will be more performant for production. So we, that, that's why I showed both examples. For one is mostly for dev, the other one is for production. Cool. Martin, thank you again very much. Please, a warm round of applause.